People have been warned for years about the dangers of eating too many saturated fats and the risks they pose for heart disease. Well, for years we've been told that foods like cheese, butter and red meat contain a lot of saturated fat. Many of us, me included, try to avoid eating them. Reducing saturated fat is an important part of the dietary advice to help lower your blood cholesterol levels. We know that eating a diet high in saturated fat increases your blood cholesterol levels. It's no surprise that foods high in saturated fat make us overweight. When we eat a diet that's high in saturated fat, our brains no longer are able to register when we're full. So the chief killer of Americans is cardiovascular disease. Keyes preached about the risks of fatty foods and their connection to high cholesterol and heart attack and stroke. You've probably been told or ingrained from a very young age that there are such things as good fats and bad fats, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Saturated fats will make you fat. Fat itself will make you fat. This science has turned the data and the public message on fat around and around several times, each time pronouncing an obscene level of certainty in their findings and dogma. Well, today, we're going to fundamentally break your inherited beliefs and coding on and around the idea of fats. Why you need them, what they're good for, and why just because someone from an authoritative figure may tell you something doesn't mean it's foolproof information. Now, before we get to this, if you haven't already been following this series, please watch our previous two videos linked on the screen here. Episode one on protein and episode two on carbohydrates. These, I believe, really do cover all the bases that you should concern yourself with in an easily digestible fashion. And all these two videos should work into this video nicely. Furthermore, I must put a disclaimer onto this video. Yet again, this video strictly refers and advises on the benefits and reasoning behind fats in a context matter concerned with training, bodybuilding, and performance. I'm less concerned with the potential medical surroundings of these, i.e. heart disease and health mainly because there is a plethora of literature and videos accessible on the matter, but I will cover this briefly. To do this again effectively in a manner to which we can understand and digest, we must break this into five learning segments. This is a bit more of a beefier one. What are fats, various types of fats, what they do, cholesterol, and finally, what fats to consume in your diet for optimability. So without further ado, let's study and investigate the surroundings and facts around fats. What are fats? The scientific definition, if you are privy to our previous videos, you'll know I always give this first, then justify it in layman's terms. Fats are also called fatty acids or lipids. Fat in our body are made up of three molecules joined together. This three molecule structure is called triglycerides. Most of the fat we need is made by our bodies, but there are some fats in our body cannot make. These are the fats that we only get by eating them. These fats are called essential fats because it is essential that we get them from food. Essential fats include omega-3 fats found in foods such as fish and flax seeds and omega-6 fats these are found in nuts, seeds, and corn oil. Obviously, we could start giving definitions and perspectives of fatty acids having one double bond and an acid chain and all the remainder of carbon atoms being single bonded. But this brings nothing to the table of interest. With what we are trying to communicate and digest here, it means nothing to our personal endeavors. So in consumable manner, fats are a micronutrient, like proteins and carbs. They provide a means to store energy and among other things that I'll explain. I believe that's the most concise, relative, and desired understanding for it at this moment of time anyway. Okay, so types of fats and what do they do? Okay, while we could review and define the, this particular question much more drilled down into the rabbit hole, we will maintain a consistency of applicable information with regards to our focus and goals. So essentially, there are about four different types of fats that's worth recognizing ourselves with. Saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, and trans fats. You've probably heard of these already, if not on packages, but from your doctor, health sites, nutritional information, etc. The consensus is, although I'm not a big fan of that particular word in science, is that saturated and trans fats are considered your unhealthy fats, while mono and poly are your good fats. Now, this is somewhat true. Mono and poly fats will deliver a slightly greater yield of benefits, but it is important to explain each one briefly anyway. Okay, so. Saturated fats. You'll hear the narrative of more saturated fats equals heart disease and clogged arteries, etc. The truth, however, may shock you. 
No direct study has confirmed that saturated fats cause or is linked with heart disease. In fact, polyunsaturated might be more closely linked to heart disease than some particular studies. When people think of saturated fats, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Beef, right? Well, actually, things like coconut oil and butter has a much more higher content of saturated fats. Even lard, you think, has complete saturated fats. Well, it's only 48% of saturated fats. In fact, beef is one of the lowest out of them all. Now, another one is saturated fats make you fat. That's not true. More accurately stated, it would be what you're exactly adding around those fats and the type of fats and what you're eating that would determine that factor. But saturated fats are required for the body, make no mistake. Research has revealed that saturated fats in butter, for example, do not negatively impact your cholesterol levels. In some cases, butter improves your cholesterol. The human body needs a minimum of around 20 grams of saturated fats per day. Butter is a good source for these saturated fats. Same goes for red meat. It is a great form of saturated fats. And before you say it, no study has directly linked red meat to increased cancer. One study in Japan in 1986 did make a noticeable link with increased cancer risk in the consumption of red meat. But wait for it. It was revealed when rats ate overcooked red meat, they developed cancer. Notice the focus of that study, overcooked. Continue to consume red meat. It's a fantastic source of fats, proteins, and amino acids. Just remove any burnt or charred parts. Additionally, avoid buying saturated or mono fats that come in plastic containers. You can use them, but just be vigilant that the light that interacts through these packages can actually leach on and damage the fats. So some of the plastic can actually leach onto the fats. Now quickly, before we move on to the next type of fat, it's important that we cover just quickly types of saturated fats and what they do. Capillic acid, that's fine in coconut oil, dairy, nuts, etc. It's perfect for immune system, antiviral, and even good for skin conditions like acne. Uh, palmitic acid, again, not seeds. Cell membranes use about 50% of this acid. It's very important. It's literally the main structural component of your human body. Luric acid, similar to capillic acid, fine in similar things, good for the immune system. And finally, butyric acid, good to feed the cells, especially for people with gut issues or leaky guts. Granted, this doesn't mean too much. Just consume 10% of your calories from saturated fats. Don't think too much into what I've just said there, but it is important to cover. Monounsaturated fats. These are the secret powerhouse meganutrient here. You should aim to make these 10, 15% of your fat intake. More than your saturated fats and poly. Derived from mostly from animal products, mono is the key to building muscle size and promoting weight loss. Out of all the fats, mono is king, really. The reason for this is it increases the level of HDL, which we will get into, but basically it's good cholesterol that leads to increased hormone production, such as growth hormone, which triggers more amino acids. So it's absolutely key here. You can get these from red meats, avocados, egg yolks, etc. Yet again, when purchasing mono unsaturated fats, try obtain these in darker containers that potentially blocks out light. Glass is okay, for example. However, the majority of you will be consuming these through the foods I mentioned above, I predict anyway. So for mono, 10 to 15% of your daily calorie uh, should be your focus on these. So a fair amount more than saturated fats. Again, the benefits of food rich in mono and saturated fats are huge, especially for uh, those of you who are obsessed with muscle growth. Eat your monos. Polyunsaturated fats, another considered good fats. But as we discussed previously, saturated isn't exactly bad. Um, it's similar to mono, it increases your HDL, increased hormone production and growth hormone production. The main considerable fats within polyunsaturated fats are omega-3 fatty acids. As you have probably seen these in just about every supplement in almost every shop, they hold great benefits for the heart, health, etc. Polyunsaturated fats are found in animal products and plant foods, including salmon, vegetable oils, nuts, and seeds. And finally, trans fats. Personally, I wouldn't worry or bother yourself with these. On almost every national medical site, they will encourage you to deter yourself away from trans fats, and I do somewhat agree. Stick with your saturated, your mono, and your polys. Consuming this kind of stuff increases your heart risk along with other stuff. As you can imagine, you get this kind of stuff from frozen pizzas, fried food, fried chicken, donuts, and whatnot. Okay, the next topic we will cover. Why fats are good for you and what they do in the body. The body and our bones require fatty acids. They are precursors for hormone production in the body. Literally everything, testosterone, that's the key for our bodybuilders there. Estrogen, cortisol, vitamin D, etc. Getting enough fat in your diet is important for staying healthy. Eating only very, very low levels of fat is not recommended. We need fat because fat helps absorb vitamins like 
A, D, E, K. Fat keeps our skin healthy. Central fats like omega-3 are important for heart health. Healthy fats like unsaturated fats from plant oils can help lower levels of LDL. That's the bad cholesterol of which we'll cover soon. But again, we're going to get into why that's a poor terminology shortly. Um, among other things fat do for your body, fat adds flavor to the food, which is great, and fat keeps you feeling satisfied longer after a meal. So please do not demonize fat. The purpose of me doing this series is to, own, if only anything, present the listener with my case as to why each micronutrient plays by the rules in a balanced diet. That's the key here. Fat is, along with others, of equal importance. They all play roles contributing to your overall health and goals. As I've outlined previously, fats must be considered in your diet, and only when one implements and understands the importance of this will they strive to greater progression and heights within their endeavors. Okay, so cholesterol, LDL and HDL. So this topic of cholesterol, LDL and HDL may appear in the first instance as a banal to, to consider. However, the rule of cholesterol and understanding it, what it does and why it's important and why implementation of such will directly increase health and performance cannot be understated. And much more, it must be examined. I also believe it's important in this case to examine this a little more thoroughly than the previous cases. Okay, so what is cholesterol? Cholesterol is a lipid. What are lipids? Lipids are a broad group of organic compounds which include fats, waxes, fat soluble and vitamins, etc. The functions of lipids include storing energy, signaling, and acting as a structural component of cell membranes. So this cholesterol, this type of lipid, it is synthesized by every cell in our body. Every cell in our body makes cholesterol. It's completely vital to us, especially to the creation of cells. Think about a cell. It's a three-dimensional and fluid. What allows them to be ever so pulsating and fluid, and it's their membranes. And it's the cholesterol inside the membrane that gives it its fluidity. In turn, this allows transportation or transporters to move across the surface of the cells, like glucose and hormones, to move across the cell membranes. In close summary, no cholesterol equals no cells. No cells equals no us. 85% of the cholesterol in our bodies is produced by the liver. The other 15% is only that. Cholesterol is the backbone of your steroid hormones. All hormones are built off the backbone of cholesterol. Cholesterol is directly linked to almost everything hormone production wise. Strength and muscle gains, growth hormone production, so much it affects. Now, it's important to discuss two important forms of this, which get confused as types of cholesterol, but really they're not, rather a means to port cholesterol around the body. You'll hear doctors say your LDL levels are high equals your cholesterol levels are high and your HDL levels are high. So what does cholesterol do? Well, we need to examine two parts of it first. LDL, low density lipoproteins. This is essentially a bus molecule. It carries from your liver cholesterol and triglycerides. So this bus travels from your liver to other tissues of your body, providing and supplying them with essential building blocks. Of course, these buses can go back to the liver as well, then get flushed out. It's essentially carrying passengers or cargo. These passengers being a certain building block for certain organs and body functions, which get off at their designated stops, others get on, some move back to the liver, etc. So in summary, this is like a ship where you can package cargo inside of it, inside of the lipid, to be transported and carried through other areas of the body or two other areas of the body. The interesting part here is the reason LDL is required is because a lipid is hydrophobic, meaning it repels in the presence of water, just like when you pour olive oil in water and it doesn't move through it or it struggles to. But we of course need these lipids to transport around the body. Therefore, LDL comes into play. It creates a type of spherical molecule inside a lipid, outside protein. The protein side being hydrophilic, meaning it can flow through water. So it allows the cargo inside the cholesterol, the fatty stores, to be transported successfully. And that's LDL. This LDL is considered bad cholesterol, but it isn't cholesterol at all. It's a carrier of cholesterol. The reason it's considered bad is because it carries stored fats being triglycerides. However, once triglycerides are broken down, this is what we burn for fuel, fat burning. So in essence, you need fat to burn fat in an essence. Now, otherwise it would store in the liver and convert into fat to which we would be unable to tap into for energy or to burn or for later use. The idea of LDL being bad is really outdated science at this point, yet doctors still push the idea of good and bad cholesterol. Now, HDL 
stand for high density lipoproteins. This is the bus back home. This takes the cholesterol and transports it back to the liver to be processed and flushed back out. Hence why they refer to as good cholesterol. But there really is no such thing as good and bad cholesterol but it's the same damn cholesterol. Now, LDL can be bad if in large amounts of sugar are at hand and present. Imagine the bus going to the designation and then it stops at the last stop, but the present sugar in the body inhibits it on its journey to drop off the cholesterol and the fatty stores. So they have nowhere to go because no one will accept it. Then, due to them being lipoproteins, they can go into artery walls and get oxidized. Once that happens, inflammation can occur um, and a bunch of ton of immune response and other things can occur. I understand this explanation may seem rather over the top for all this and the initial observation on the topic of fats, but I feel it's important for you to understand. Finally, what you've been waiting for, what fats to consume in your diet for optimal mobility. As always, in the previous two videos, I gave a blueprint cheat codes and roughly what your diet should look like in conclusion to consuming dietary fats. Let's do it again. Go. To cover your saturated fat intake to be sufficient, consuming a modest amount of butter or cooking in your coconut oil should suffice for your required intake. In other forms like mono and poly, consuming egg yolks daily, along with other forms of good dietary fats like peanut butter, cashews, almond nuts or seeds, um, and the intake of omega-3s, be it directly from fish like salmon or supplementation, should be suffice. In a main plan setup, as fat mi micros should be around 20 to 30 percent of your total calorie for a default example, consuming some form of fats every second, fourth, and sixth meal should be sufficient enough. And that concludes the overall view of fats. I sincerely hope you've all enjoyed and learned something from these three episodes, um, or be it even a refresher on some topics that you already knew before. If you enjoyed the series, don't worry, I do plan to do an additional episode four to cover all these previous three episodes to put it into some sort of a menu plan that would look in a conclusion. Remember, if you enjoyed the videos, please like and sub and comment with any questions. It really does help us and motivate me to do this a lot more. For now, I've been Carl from the Oxden. You take care of yourself.